Thank you so much, Nishant, and thank you, Brad, for uh, the opportunity to talk. And uh, I just want to um, uh, thank you all as well, the audience, for taking your time out to, to take a listen to hopefully what I think will be an informative talk. Um, so uh, as you saw on the schedule, we sort of, we sort of uh, got this uh, teaming up today uh, with a talk on on, on general approaches to a fluoroscopy-free uh, EP ablation procedure that you may have uh, heard already. And uh, uh, Mansur Rizmania and I sort of teamed up to uh, do a, basically a two-part series. So I'm going to sort of give an introductory talk on ICE basics, uh, something that I think has become ubiquitous, at least in the United States and now beyond in the EP lab. And then uh, Mansoor is gonna, is gonna sort of go into more detail on the advanced topic. So it's sort of like ICE 101 and then ICE 201 or 301. So, so without further ado, I'm gonna get started here. Here's some disclosures. Uh, so so the, here's an outline of what I'm gonna talk to you about today. Uh, the rationale for why we use ICE and EP, uh, very basic principles of ICE catheters, the nomenclatures for views and catheter movement, uh, basic intracardiac views and some case examples that I think will be illustri illustrative of, um, of some of the important uh, concepts I want to talk about today. So, uh, of course, it's a catheter-based technology. It uh, allows uh, real-time 2D echo imaging of cardiac structures and blood flow. The ultrasound transducer is mounted onto the catheter tip. Uh, the catheter is inserted usually through the femoral vein and then maneuvered into the heart, typically somewhere between an 8 and 9 French diameter. And uh, why? why? Why is this a, an important topic? Well, uh, as, um, uh, as you heard about, um, I would advocate that reliance on fluoroscopy has significant limitations. Um, ICE allows visualization of structures that you otherwise cannot see with fluoroscopy and even with mapping systems. And ICE allows visualization of catheter tissue relationships in particular, which are, uh, can be critical for a safe and effective procedure. And then it helps you in the process of uh, elimination of fluoroscopy for your procedures, uh, which uh, there are a, mul a multitude of uh, benefits from. And uh, I think you would I would advocate that uh, we haven't perhaps demonstrated it rigorously yet, but I would, I would uh, hypothesize that ICE imaging may improve our success in procedures. So, so getting more detail into the pros and cons of doing this. So, so it is uh, really, uh, if you think about it, is perhaps the one real-time imaging uh, modality that we use in EP today. And we can, as a result, image not only the cardiac tissue structures, but all the stuff we put into the heart, into the cardiac chambers. And so, as I said, it may improve safety as a result and eliminate or reduce fluoroscopy use. There are cons, of course. Uh, nothing comes without uh, negatives. Uh, it does require a new catheter manipulation and interpretation skill set, which hopefully our talk here today and Mansour's later uh, this evening will help you out with uh, moving forward. Uh, it does require an additional access site for vascular access, and there is, of course, an added cost. <clears throat> so uh, here are the available devices in the United States. So, uh, so many of you are familiar with the uh, Cardo Sound device, which is really an adaptation of the GE Acunav platform, and then Abbott St. Jude has their own device as well here. And I'll show you images from both. Uh, so, so there's I don't I don't really think there's a significant. Uh, a substantive difference between the two. There are some important differences, and I'm happy to go over those uh, as I have experience with both. Uh, but basically, I want to go over things more in a generic principle sense and, and uh, help you understand the principles to, to get you to that next level of using ICE in your EP uh, uh, workflow. All right, so the first thing you want to do is, of, of course, understand how you move the catheter. So the basic principles of that are, as you can see in the schematic here on the left, your ICE catheter has the imaging sector coming out of the tip. Now, one thing that's maybe a little peculiar if you think about it is that the fan of imaging comes off from the side of the catheter rather than the front. So the analogy I always like to use, it's imagine you're trying to drive a car and you're uh, only able to look out the side window. You're not really looking out the front windshield. Uh, so you have to be able to drive by doing that. And, and that's, that's, that does require a little bit of, um, of uh, learning. Uh, so, so, but otherwise, the catheters move very similarly to other catheters that you're familiar with, but in fact, perhaps with a little bit more uh, um, uh, 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 
uh, options for movement of the catheter. And I'll go over that in the next slide. Uh, but basically, the other the other issue to know about is, of course, the standard display. So most labs in the U.S. Uh, use a, this type of display. Even though the catheter we think of going into the body in this direction, uh, we, we sort of turn it 90 degrees. And as the catheter moves from left to right, the image moves from left to right. So generally speaking, the left of the screen is uh, more inferior in the body, and the right is more uh, superior. Uh, in particular, you might see folks from uh, from the pen group. They, they like to flip that image around, which there's some rationale uh, to that in terms of how it orients with the actual body. All right, so, so in terms of manipulating the catheter, these are, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but I think if you walk through this, you'll understand pretty easily what, what we're talking about here. So, um, so, so like most catheters, you have the basics of, of course, advancing and retracting the catheter. You can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. But the added features here I've pointed out, and all, all the catheter platforms have this, there's an anterior and posterior tilt and a left and right tilt. And what that does is it gives you a, a full range of, 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 uh, range of motion. Uh, and then there's a friction knob often uh, that lets you lock that catheter into position. And uh, the, the general nomenclature, as I've sh shown here in the schematic, is that with the ice fan sector looking in this direction towards the right on the screen, anterior is towards that sector and posterior is away from that sector. And that's an important, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Sorry, I'm trying to move the uh, pictures out of the way here. All right. All right, so, um, so here's just a, a very short video. When you, when you do anterior, posterior tilt, you're moving the catheters left and right, or, or so your anterior to posterior, uh, depending on the fan is, and left and right to move in an orthogonal direction. And, and they all come into play, but I'll say in general, I'd say most, uh, most of the time when I've observed this, most folks are just focusing primarily on the AP movement. The left to right is more of a subtle fine tuning kind of a movement, where, uh, but there are important places where that isn't an important uh, move to be able to understand and use. So first things first, though, getting the ice catheter into the heart. So especially if you're using a procedure that, uh, uh, that uh, does not utilize fluoroscopy, you have to be able to drive that catheter safely into the heart. And that part of that is understanding anatomy. And the other part is understanding that concept I mentioned earlier, where, as you can see in the schematic, it's like driving forward with, while looking out the side window. And, uh, and, and the key there is you have enough of a view on the side window to see the vascular space. And as long as you see that your vascular space and the walls are running parallel to your catheter, generally speaking, it's going to be a safe direction to move. You use tactile feedback as well. And as you move through the vascular structures, you should be able to identify things like uh, 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 venous branches, the liver, and then eventually get yourself into the heart. Uh, one very small tip that I'd, I'd suggest is we often put the, the uh, catheter through the left femoral vein. Uh, I did a literature search on this, and there's actually a, a uh, surprisingly high uh, prevalence of an anomalous connection between the left iliac vein and the left renal vein, which then creates a, a, a 90 degree or greater angle between those two structures. So oftentimes when we see on fluoro, you have this very sharp turn, and uh, the catheter doesn't, doesn't seem to want to go well in that direction, if you anticipate that possibility and you meet, meet, make a very sharp turn, that, that often is the answer as to why that happens. All right. So once you get in the heart, uh, we, use a, we all use a standard nomenclature, like a lot of things we do that are rotational, a clock face anatomy. Uh, and so this is a schematic that shows you the overall, arch, the overarching and um, sort of clock face view and the different views in that home view that I'll go over. So going from 12 o'clock to three to six, of course, and then to nine. And I'm gonna go over step by step each of these. Uh, so starting with the, um, the upper right quadrant from 12 to three o'clock, uh, this starts with what we call a home view. So once you've entered into the heart, this is generally what you land on, a home view. And you, know, you can identify the home view by knowing that you're in the right atrium. And we should all, of course, recognize this when you sort of extrapolate from our understanding of, of transthoracic or even TE echo. And then you have a tricuspid route valve, right ventricle, and you should be able to often get a glimpse of the aortic valve. A few tips here. So uh, the heart almost invariably sits a touch anterior to the IVC, so you have to create a slight anterior tilt of your ice catheter to enter the RA in many patients. And uh, once in the RA, you then uh, release that, and in fact, sometimes you need a slightly posterior tilt to see, the, to see most of the right atrium. 
All right, so uh, so our, our talk is not going to be free of, of uh, audience polling questions. So I tried to throw in a few questions. Uh, this I, I kept in mind this is a basic talk, so I'm not trying to go crazy on on, on the questions. Uh, so, but I think things that will illustrate the anatomy. So this is our first question: What key anatomic structure can be usually located very near the X marked on this image? So uh, Bachmann's bundle, bundle of Hisk, CTI, right coronary artery. I see the answers showing up here. Give just a few more seconds. I see some some answers still rolling in. Okay, we've I think we've reached steady state. Yep. Okay. So if you can see here, most of you got the right answer, and this is what I expect to see on all the polling questions here. I'm keeping it simple, uh, but this is the bundle of hiss, and I wanted to in, um, in, uh, introduce uh, the anatomic relationships that you can uh, identify through ice and understand better through ice. In fact. So, um, so that that move that that sort of brings us to these home view variants that we can see. And as I mentioned, you have uh, your RA tricuspid valve, RV, and all of these views, the aortic valve. But uh, based on depending on the anatomy, you may see more or less of the aortic valve. You see may, may see the aortic valve more in a short axis or a uh, long axis or even a skewed view. Uh, but those are all sort of considered your home view that you, that you can used to manipulate and get into the, um, the, the right views that you're looking for for your, your purposes of your particular study. Um, and getting to that, that question I asked about, so the importance of that an anatomic relationship for EP in particular. Uh, so when we're in the home view, keep in mind, uh, seeing the aorta here where it's juxtaposed against the tricuspid valve, we're looking at in this anatomic cutaway you see here, uh, a, a relationship between the aortic valve and in particular the non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve and uh, the proximal conduction system. And why is this important? Uh, you know, sometimes you can see your catheter sitting there and you might be thinking, uh, this, is this uh, where I can find the hiss? And uh, the short answer is this is uh, often the time you can, I find often you can, um, it's a parlor trick, but you can often just put your diagnostic catheter based on ice right in that location before you even look at the electrograms. And, and when you turn and look at the electrograms, you'll find a hiss right there. So it's quite useful to, to augment your, your catheter placement. And, uh, and it'll be very useful as you can imagine if you're, and I'll show you some examples at the end of this session uh, where ablation in this region becomes, of course, as we know, some of the hairier uh, ablations that we perform. Uh, and and uh, that can be quite helpful to, to understand the ice relationships of that anatomy. <clears throat> All right, so that, so we already went over this, but uh, the, the correct answer is the bundle of piss. All right, so we move from the home view, and this requires, uh, if we're just going systematically through this clock face, a slight clockwise uh, a, a torque of the catheter, usually not much more than doing just that, and there are some slight adjustments that you need to make, and you often end up with a view where you can see something like this, so that leads us to another question. So if you could correctly identify, I know the, the, the stuff's moving a bit, but in fact, I can freeze this here in a uh, spot that gives you a nice view. Okay, here we go. So there's structures one, two, and three. So uh, are, is one, two, and three, uh, which I'm not gonna go over these because these are, I'm just gonna be repetitive here, but look through the answers uh, of identifying the correct coronary cusps. And again, I, I, I tried to keep this all very simple, but just to make sure we are all on the same page with, uh, with the anatomy. I'll give a few more seconds for the polling. Great. Okay, so as you can see, a, a majority got the correct answer, uh, where number one is the non-coronary cusp, number two is the right coronary cusp, number three is the left coronary cusp. And I'll go over um, how that, I'll just actually go ahead and keep moving forward, but I'll go over how that relationship can be identified and actually taken advantage of on ice as well. So, but that gets us to this view that I said with just a little bit of a clock, it's, it's essentially the anterior views of, um, of uh, the atria and then with a view of the aortic valve. Uh, it's, it can be quite similar to a view you can get just on the other side of the valve in the RVOT, and you can often see the proximal uh, uh, coronary uh, vessels. In this right-sided view, you're a little closer to the RCA, so, so it's more likely that you'll see the RCA as opposed to the left main, which is in the opposite direction from on the or opposite side, excuse me, on the aortic valve. And this can be a quite useful view if you're uh, mapping and ablating near the aortic cusps. 
Uh, and by the way, as importantly to note, um, uh, you can see the relationship here between the aorta in these views and the left atrium. And, uh, and speaking of the left atrium, then as you move uh, forward a little bit, uh, so, so uh, actually before we get to that, this is just the answer that we talked about. So, so, um, so how do you identify all that? So here are the hints from this view. First of all, you're, we're viewing from the right atrium. So you, you, you need to understand that uh, in the aortic cusps, uh, the non-coronary cusps will be the cusp that is uh, most uh, closely abutted to the right atrium. Uh, the left coronary cusp will be the one that's most closely uh, associated with the left atrium down here, number three. And, and then the RCA is the one over here far to the right. And as I said earlier, another hint is as you see the uh, takeoff of the RCA in this view. All right. So again, with a little bit of rotate, a little bit of further rotation from that view I just showed you, you start to see these other other structures. Uh, so these are views where uh, where where certain uh, where some some uh, some advantages can be taken uh, taken here. So one is uh, you'll encounter often the ostium of the coronary sinus, and as you can see here, um, a lot of folks who use ice a lot will actually place their diagnostic catheters in the coronary sinus using ice uh, alone, or at least in augmentation with the mapping system. Um, you can often in this view, get a view directly across the inter anterior interatrial septum, see the mitral valve on, I see on the upper right here, as well as a glimpse of the left atrial appendage. And, one, and, and you can see I'm showing a lot of variants. And the other thing to highlight about this is, of course, uh, every patient has uh, different anatomy and you have to sort of take advantage of how their anatomy, what their anatomy gives you in terms of views in order to let you see uh, the structures you're trying to see. And then you have to have in your toolbox uh, different views uh, that, that say, you know, if I can't see the appendage well in this view, what's the other views two or three that I can take advantage of to if I'm trying to see the appendage, for example. And hopefully af after we've gone through some of these views, you can, you can sort of assimilate all those different um, tools that, that they can use to, to try to image whatever structure you're trying to image. Oftentimes in this view, you can see not just the left atrial appendage, but you can see here, not the, just the mitral valve, but this is the appendage ridge that you can see um, uh, here. Um, and this is it's possible to, to even visualize thrombus uh, in this view, uh, although it's not as clear as some of the other views that I'll show you a little bit later. So with a little bit of uh, clockwise rotation, then you get into a little bit more posterior uh, aspect of the atria. And this allows you to see the interatrial fossa or, uh, in, uh, and septum and the, uh, some of the left atrial structures. So here's another, another uh, quick question. So correctly identify these anatomic structures. So we're looking at the posterior view of the left atrium. So choices A, B, C, or D. And again, because of their, their long, long answers, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to um, read them out. Few more seconds for some answers to show up here. All right, so this one's a little bit more distributed. I'm, I guess I'm a little surprised, uh, but but that's okay. So so um, so what we're seeing here you know, is is the posterior view of the atrium, and how do we uh, how do we identify structures here? So again, when you make a little bit more clockwise tilt, you often will see the thin portion of the interatrial septum, and if you're posterior enough you'll see these structures that are posterior and far away from the septum. And what are those? Well, those are your left pulmonary veins. Now, this is an idealized view that we don't always see, but uh, in these, uh, you know, a lot of us call this like a pants view because it looks like a, a, a large person wearing a pair of pants here. Uh, but, um, but what you're seeing here is, if you keep in mind the orientation, so our catheter is inferior here, superior on the right, this is then the left superior vein, and this is the left inferior vein. So that's number one. And sometimes you can, if you really want to, you can Doppler then say a redo a patient that you're worried about PV stenosis. Um, you will often see, you can see the relationship between the left interior vein and the descending aorta. Uh, and then uh, you might, uh, in the more leftward sitting esophagus, you might see a view of the esophagus. And this is a useful view for sort of identifying an ideal, a typically a typical location for performing a transeptal puncture for visualizing the esophagus or performing a wire exchange if that's something that in your workflow. All right, so moving on from that, then as you continue to rotate, you'll get more and more posterior with your catheter. Uh, you start to see even more posterior structures. And this gets to the second part of that question I asked about. So as you go more 
posterior, you will uh, then often align with the esophagus. And you'll notice the esophagus is you'll often be able to visualize as in these four different examples, a double stripe or at least an ex slightly echolucent stripe. Uh, and uh, in that, uh, when you see it adjacent to the posterior wall of the left atrium and you know your posterior because you see your interatrial septum opposite to it, then uh, you can correctly identify that as the, as the esophagus. And I don't do this workflow, but uh, there are many who, in a fluoroscopy-free approach, for instance, will, will keep a, an eagle eye on the esophagus while they place a temperature probe. And you can uh, often identify the temperature probe as it passes into view and, in fact, move it back and forth up and down along the posterior wall to, uh, to, to track your ablation and esophageal heating. So, so this is also a useful view for, for especially left atrial ablation. So then getting back to our question, uh, the, the majority did get it correct, but um, the idea is that uh, with this, these different views, you can identify the left pulmonary veins often, which are sort of a good road or landmark for uh, transeptal puncture and other, other uh, interatrial uh, uh, steps in your procedure, and then often identify the, the course of the esophagus. So that's that sort of posterior view. Now, if you keep rotating, uh, then uh, this, is, this gets to be a little harder often to see because of the way these veins take off, but you often can't identify one or both of the right pulmonary veins. So, so when you rotate very posteriorly, the right pulmonary vein, if you think about it, you're in the right atrium, so the, the right superior pulmonary vein will take off above you and uh, uh, just abutting you, especially if you're heading up towards the SVC. And this is another one of those understanding the an anatomic relationships, if, especially if you're up in the SVC region, uh, as you know, uh, oftentimes this is where we can capture both uh, phrenic nerve from both sides of this septum, uh, and so they're, they're, these tend to be very close structures to each other. Uh, and then if you um, uh, see this, these are a couple of other different examples, and then once in a while you can also identify taking off from below the right inferior pulmonary vein, as you see down here, and, and you can see here trying to engage the right inferior pulmonary vein with a mapping catheter where that can be useful. All right, so, so you keep turning, of course, we could sort of, uh, sort of uh, complete the circle. And as you keep turning, you're going to sort of leave the views of the left atrium and come back to your right atrium. And once you're back in the right atrium, you're, you're going to see the more anterior structures of the right atrium. So uh, that, can be, that can include the right atrial appendage, the, uh, the uh, 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 crystal term analysis, analysis uh, at least the anatomic marker of it. Uh, where the change from the, the pectinated tissues from the smooth tissues can be observed. All right, so this I think there's a last question, uh, but so 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 what is the typical best view during ablation procedures for evaluation of pericardial effusion with I, I should say with ice? Is it the RV free wall from the RA home view? Is it the RV free wall from within the RV? Is it the LV inferior wall from within the RV or the RA free wall from the RA home view? <clears throat> Paul, maybe I'll use this uh, as a chance to ask a question that came through. Um, if you could go over the relationship between the aorta and where you do a transeptal puncture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So if I could shelf that for like a few slides, uh, the, one, the first case example I wanted to just quickly go over, I think we'll, we'll give you some, some, um, some, some uh, answer to that. That's okay. Oh, yeah, of course. All right, great. So remind me if I forget to mention that specifically, but yeah. All right, so in terms of the poll answer, so there's a little bit more distribution here as well, but most, most said LV inferior wall from within the RV, and I'll explain to you why that is correct uh, in a few slides, all right? Okay. So that gets us to the next view. So, so I, I, I guess I wouldn't call this 101 anymore. We're starting to get to ICE 102 perhaps. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call this 201 yet. Um, but um, so, so what are the images we can get now we move beyond that, that home base of the right atrium? So, uh, so we, got, we can see things if we get the catheter into the RV, um, and, and that's not just the RV and the LV, but we can see all these other structures, as I said here. I'll show you how we can look at the outflow tract, uh, the left atrial appendage, and even the coronary ostea. So how do you get there, though? So that's important for, for understanding that one of those earlier slides I showed about how to drive yourself when you're looking at the side of your catheter. So you start out in your home view here, as you see in the left image, and uh, you can then sort of counterclock a little bit so you see 
uh, instead of at the home view, now you see the, the um, tricuspid valve right in front of you. So you know that your tip is right here, your tricuspid valve is just under your catheter right here. And then as you slowly advance forward, you, you'll basically see yourself cross the tricuspid valve. And I'll show you a, a little bit of a longer clip here. So the idea is when you flex anterior from the home view, uh, you're aiming for that tricuspid valve. And you can see here I've had to do a little bit of clock adjustment to keep in uh, the tricuspid valve in view. And once I'm seeing the valve, I push forward. And again, you have to keep tactile feedback to make sure there's no resistance. And then once you're in the RV, you release a little curve and perform a little bit of clock. It's so very similar to the kind of move to get to the outflow tract to do either outflow tract ablation or even to float a swan. You're sort of uh, climbing up into the outflow tract essentially. And then once you do that, you, you're going to pass the septum. This is looping again. So you can see once you're in the RV, you see the, uh, the, the valvular apparatus. This, you're sort of transecting the septum in your ice view. And eventually you get into a view where you see the LV in a long axis view. And you can see here, uh, there's a nice view of the LV inferior base and the epicardial space. Uh, so these are, there are a lot of variants. Again, get back to that principle I mentioned earlier where uh, different anatomies um, uh, present themselves in different ways. Uh, you sort of have to take advantage of what you can see. And these are just sort of variants that I've collected over time. And uh, this can be a very useful view, especially for LV mapping and ablation. Uh, so looking from the RV and different, this is a very basal view of the RV, but you almost see like a two-chamber view with a nice view of the septum in cross-section. So it's, you can often get that kind of a view. This is a different view of that where you can also see a little bit of the papillary uh, apparatus. This is a more classic view of the LV chamber where you can see very clearly the papillary muscles and the, mitral, the rest of the mitral apparatus. And you can also, of course, get a good assessment of when you have dilated cardiomyopathy. And, uh, and then if you just continue on a little bit and continue to rotate, you start to look upwards more and more, you can start seeing the outflow tract and the uh, aortic valve apparatus up higher. Uh, and this is, uh, this, uh, this is uh, to answer the question, uh, in, um, I think in most people's opinion, the best view to evaluate for pericardial fusion. And that's, you have to just think about physics. So in our typical EP procedure where a patient is supine, presuming a new effusion is, is free flowing, uh, it's going to collect in the dependent space. And if you think about the way the heart typically sits uh, while a patient is supine, uh, the space uh, behind the LV at the base in particular is going to be the, the um, uh, most likely place that a free-flowing effusion will collect. Of course, the caveat is we, off, we do see, not often, but there can be loculated effusions uh, in different spaces. So if you see hemodynamic issues, you, you, you can scan through uh, other spaces to, to look for that. Um, especially if, if for whatever reason, for instance, that effusion starts to clot off and, and such. But this is typically the best view for a free-flowing effusion. And, and in my workflow, at the end of every single case, I'll, I'll stick the ice catheter back in the RV and take a quick look in this area. It really lets you relax and, and not be as worried about um, any, any uh, post-procedural uh, uh, hypotension that you might encounter. So getting to your, the answer to this, then uh, the LV inferior wall from within the RV, especially towards the base, is your best view for that effusion. So beyond that LV view, then, if, as I said, if you, if you then continue to clock your catheter, just like you're going to the outflow tract, which you actually are, then you can start seeing those structures in the outflow tract. And this left upper view is sort of the typical sort of view you land on, where you can see here, this is a, a glimpse of the aortic valve. And as you look uh, with your sector out into the aortic valve, you can see the relationship between the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. And this is a really nice view to let you see, you know, when you perform, for instance, septal RVOT ablation, the relationship between the left-sided and right-sided uh, outflow tract uh, regions. And uh, in particular, when you see that you can't get it from the RV outflow tract, you can often see how close you are when you go in from the uh, left side when you're when you uh, then take a retrograder or even transeptal approach, which, which um, is uh, often not as effective, of course. Uh, then if you look over here, you can get, if you, if you advance the catheter carefully, often you can get a much clearer view of that outflow tract. I'm not going to keep going past the outflow into the pulmonic arteries. Uh, that's going to be part of uh, ICE-201, uh, that, that where you can start seeing all kinds of interesting stuff as you get out farther, farther that way, but suffice it to say that that I think uh, Mansoor is going to be talking to you about some of that kind of stuff. And then if you change the views a little bit with a little bit left or right tilt, sometimes you can get a long view of the aortic root. And uh, other than just looking uh, interesting and cool, 
uh, there's, a, there's actually quite a u good use for that. So, so say you're performing a retrograde um, uh, aortic uh, approach to get into the LV and to try to prolapse your catheter. Well, this is actually a really good view to see the, the, the loop that you make, the catheter prolapsing, and this is a typical view I try to look at uh, for, for performing that step. And then oftentimes, again, you take what you can get with the anatomy, but in the correct type of uh, patient anatomy, you can often see, as you can see here, a glimpse of the left main ostium. <clears throat> All right, let's see, we're on time. I think we're doing well. All right, so then, uh, so then if you just keep uh, uh, pulling back a little bit and, uh, and then now rotating uh, just a tad from that aortic view, uh, some, you know, sort of just, just go clock counterclock until you can start seeing it in view as you pull back. You'll get, start to see the left atrium uh, sort of as you scan across the aorta, as you can see in the upper left here, and look into the left atrium. Now, why is this view useful and interesting? Well, this is one of the other views where you can often visualize the left atrial appendage reasonably well. Uh, these are a few examples of seeing the left atrial appendage. And in fact, you can see here a nice view of the ridge. And what I've been, uh, I've been um, sort of taken by is uh, in this view is how often you see a really thick uh, a ridge there. And, and it's no wonder that this area is at least, at least perhaps until recently with, with some of the ablation approaches we use, this is often an area of, of, of typical reconnection that we can see. Uh, but that relationship is very useful. And in fact, you can often see your ablation catheter. I think I might have an example of that later on, uh, sitting on one side or another of that ridge. <clears throat> All right. All right, so then to, to, to the last part of this, I just wanted to show you some case examples that really illustrate how you can leverage your ice, ice uh, skills. Uh, this, is, uh, this is some basic stuff still, though. And so this is a case of a 69-year-old woman with hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, PAF, failed meds, so referred for catheter ablation uh, with RF we're using and a zero fluoroscopy approach. So how is ICE useful for this? You might have seen this in the previous talk if you were there for uh, Dr. Singh's talk, uh, but um, there are many ways to skin a cat, but this is, uh, this is the, the approach I use for transeptal, and this reminds me of the discussion or the question about the relationship between the aorta and uh, the uh, septum. Uh, so so uh, before I answer that, so, so what I typically do is uh, to take a view where you can actually, you can see on the top here, uh, what is this structure here? So we see the left atrium chamber here. We see the upper portion of the inner atrial septum here because we're in the right side. And so this, this structure that's going up uh, linearly is the SVC. And what you see here is you can use this view to advance a wire uh, without using fluoroscopy. And using the wire, as you can see in the bottom left panel, you can advance your sheath over the wire. You can see that sheath passing over the wire right there. You can see right there where the sheath ends and the wire begins. And then uh, you can remove your wire, as you can see in the middle panel here. Uh, and as you pull the wire back, then you, you have your sheath in place. Um, and then as you uh, have that uh, uh, sheath apparatus up in the needle, up in the uh, upper portions of the septum in the SVC, you can perform a drag down and, and uh, then uh, land in, your, uh, in the appropriate location of the interatrial septum using that more posterior view. And what I like about this view is then you can try to identify a, uh, an ideal position to, to perform your puncture. And you can see a glimpse of the left pulmonary vein system here so we know we're posterior enough to be able to, um, to, to direct the needle. And that's a, I'll advocate that with ice, this is one thing that's a huge advantage over fluoroscopy in that you can you can much more precisely direct your uh, puncture site, uh, whether it's anterior, posterior, high or low, depending on the application you're using. And then, uh, and then once you uh, are in the right location, uh, the location you'd like, this is, uh, this is, I use an RF catheter and you can very well see, this is another nice view of how what you can see is, is uh, a very clear relationship between the tip of your needle or dilator and the, the, the walls of the endocardium. So you know you're very safe with the sheath and dilator in this position. You're not gonna puncture the posterior wall because you can see that relationship very clearly. Now you might ask, uh, what about the if, what, if you're sort of abutted against the wall uh, out of the plane? Well, you can obviously move your, your ice catheter back and forth to see the relationship between the side walls. And as you can see here, blowing a, a few micro bubbles lets you know that you're in, in free space territory. And then once there, you can continue to use that view to move your sheath in place, as you can see on the left and then uh, advance your mapping or ablation catheter out into the left atrium. You can see there, 
or use this for a wire exchange uh, as you uh, sort of uh, cannulate the, the left inferior pulmonary vein in this case. All right, um, so actually I'm going to, um, before I uh, just go over this next case, just mention, um, let's see, let me think of a good example of that. I think I'd have to go back a little bit to show you. Maybe at the end I'll show you, but the in terms of the relationship, I'll just stop here and just talk in terms of that question of the relationship between the um, interatrial septum and the aorta. So if you take a um, traditional fluoroscopy approach, we all do, uh, so we all learned, uh, at least those of us who still were old enough to learn a fluoroscopy-based transeptal puncture, as we do a, uh, a, an SVC drag down and, the, the, and we look for that sort of, uh, those, those couple of hops, that first hop lands us, uh, we learn traditionally on the aortic knob. And some folks will even put a pigtail catheter in the aortic root to identify that on fluoroscopy. And then the second drag down puts you into the interatrial septum. Well, you can see all of that on ice, and you don't, uh, of course, need a pigtail catheter in the aortic space. And what is invariably true with the anatomy, even uh, with all the variants that, that, that humans have, the aorta tends to sit uh, more anterior and superior to the interatrial septum. And depending on how vertical versus horizontal the heart is, it can be completely just uh, a, a relationship of anterior to posterior from the aorta to the septum or completely superior to inferior in a more vertical heart. And, uh, and, and the way I sort of judge that is you sort of do a, uh, you do a dry run, so to speak, not pulling the, the sheath and, and needle down first, but just pulling your ice down. And you can see as you pull down and you see the aorta, does it require a clock to move posterior to see the septum, which tells you it's more of a horizontal approach or a, just a straight pull down, which tells you it's more of a vertical relationship between those two structures. So um, hopefully that's answering that question. Uh, but this is uh, the second case where I, I wanted to show you some of the uh, uh, leveraging of ice that we can use. As a more, even more simple case, a 74-year-old woman with hypertension, no other significant medical history, atrial fibrillation and flutter, had uh, three catheter ablations before, uh, performed before, before at another institute, uh, with, uh, including CTI ablation with block confirmed 20, 30 minute waiting period uh, at those uh, other procedures. But a year later, actually uh, vexingly developed recurrent atrial flutter and referred to us for repeat ablation. And this is to highlight this issue that ICE really gives you an advantage of over every other modality. So, given, uh, so in this kind of a case, what I do is, is you know, I don't use de novo CTI ablation ice. Uh, I will actually avoid that if possible just for cost and access savings. Uh, but in a patient who is coming back for now a fourth procedure, uh, you know, you throw the book at them basically. And what I find is invariably ice will identify the problem. And in this particular case, it's a, it's a very common problem uh, that you're seeing here. So, so, so what do you see is the problem here? I didn't do a polling question here, but I'll just ask, uh, I'll just ask rhetorically. So, so so um, what the issue here, if you go on to the next slide here, is in the CTI, the CTI's, uh, CTI ablation, we all like to say they're really easy, except when they're not. Uh, and and uh, those not cases are the ones that vex us and take hours and hours. And uh, more often than not, the reason for that is illustrated both anatomically here by drawing uh, and, um, and here on ice. You can see two examples of this that I've collected. And, uh, and what, they're sh what we're showing here is that here is our trus in the bottom one, tricuspid valve, uh, CTI, and what you're seeing here is a eustachian ridge. And sometimes they can be so prominent, and you can see them actually sometimes contracting, so you know there's conducting myocardial tissue there. And uh, more often than not, you'll find that that is the area that you need to, to ablate additionally to, to uh, confirm CTI block. And so in this case, that, that I showed you an example of this. We're happy to use a visualized catheter, but you almost invariably will need to then create that, that shepherd's crook or, or loop to get and tug back or tuck back into that eustachian ridge. And, uh, and in this case, uh, um, let's see if I showed you that map here or not. No, okay, so, so in this case, then ablation here, I, didn't, I, I actually had this early in an earlier version, but in this case, uh, you could see a conduction pathway through that zone and just a little bit of ablation that within a few seconds of turning on RF, the patient's uh, CTI reblocked um, and, and uh, patient has had not, not had recurrence. Now, ICE can also let you see some weird things. So what, is the, what, is this, uh, what does this show you? So I, again, didn't have a polling question, uh, but this is a home view RV, RA tricuspid valve. So this was a de novo diagnosis of an Epstein anomaly, 
uh, that we, we diagnosed with, um, with ICE. And uh, you know, how do we know that? Well, this, there's that uh, apical displacement of the valve, but also we were recording nice ventricular signals on the, uh, the anatomic atrial side of this valve. So, so, so you can see all kinds of things with ice. <clears throat> and these are just uh, some more of a, a flavor kind of things as we're wrapping up. So some other uh, ideas of where you can use ice. This is a parahysian AT that we ablated using with ice as a very important part of our fluoroscopy free approach to this. Of course, that's, this is one of the hairier places to ablate. Uh, but what we found is marking, ma mapping on the right side, uh, the ablation spots that we wanted to ablate were, uh, uh, as often is the case, uh, uh, sort of overlapped with our, our HIS recordings. So we went retrograde aortic, and you can see here on ice uh, that we were able to visualize placing the catheter directly in opposition to the best sites from the right atrium and uh, did not see a HIS signal there and were able to successfully ablate here. And just as a note, th th we just marked here the, the ostium of the coronaries so that we knew where they are, were and also a, a, a sort of skeletal view of each of the, the aortic uh, cusps. So, so, so one example where ice can be quite helpful. And this is another one where we performed LV summit ablation uh, using ice and uh, I didn't have a, as good a recording here, but this one was sort of a cool one because this is a patient we did without fluoroscopy uh, who had dextrocardia. So using cardo sound, which is a registration of the ice images to your electroanatomic map, we could see uh, all the chambers before we performed our transeptal so we know where everything is in relation to everything else in a patient with dextrocardia. And uh, you can see here, uh, th this, is, this is actually um, uh, rotated as you can see, so everything's pointing rightward as is typically the case. All right, so to wrap up, uh, I hope I've given you a few, uh, a few uh, highlights here. So uh, we talked about how ICE utilization requires a new skill set. We, we went through some of that skill set, at least the basics of it. Uh, I, I hope we could, I could el illustrate how ICE use re uses real-time visualization of cardiac structures, really the only modality we have currently to do that. And views of all cardiac structures to significant detail can be easily achieved from basically two, two locations of the catheter with, with slight rotations from the RA or within the RV slash RVOT. But you have to keep in mind that we only see one 2D plane, one sector, so we have to be able to have the skill sets to move that catheter around, know where it is, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, know where to go. And uh, ICE, uh, along with mapping systems, of course, really helps us get to that point. These are the key tools to allow us to both uh, either reduce or eliminate our use of fluoroscopy during our EP procedures. And so I'm going to wrap up by just acknowledging and thanking my colleagues here at the Brigham. Uh, uh, we have a wonderful team, and I think you've heard talks from at least uh, a few of our um, other faculty members, and, um, and I'll wrap up here. Here's my contact information if any of you are interested uh, and want to reach out to me for any, any questions or anything. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. That was great. Um, there are a few questions here. Uh, I guess some people want to know what types of cases are you routinely using ice for? It sounds like not for CTI ablations, but what cases do you go into where you say, I'm definitely going to use an ice catheter here? Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so for sure, all complex ablations. So anytime I'm, I'm going to be performing a transeptal puncture, you know, I, ice is essential for my workflow. There are folks who use mapping systems for transeptal, but I find ice so helpful for, for the transeptal and then beyond once we're in the left atrium for, for mapping, identifying structures. Uh, for uh, more or less all ventricular mapping and ablation, I'll use ice. And then I don't use ice, as I mentioned, for first time CTI ablation, uh, basic CTI ablation, and I don't use ice for uh, most SVTs. Uh, certainly if, we're, if we know we're going to be performing a uh, left-sided pathway ablation, then, then I'll use ice for the transeptal portion. And then how confident are you in your ICE imaging? W would you skip a TEE before a left atrial procedure because you think you can clear the appendage? Would you skip an angiogram for a cusp ablation if you can see the coronaries? Ah, so those are, that's, the, that's the great question that's, that's I think uh, we need to answer as a field right now. Um, I feel confident that I can visualize the appendage very well and reliably in nearly every case. Uh, but frankly, um, I don't think the data are out there to support doing that standalone. And if you ran into some trouble, even if you had a stroke that was likely completely unrelated to a left atrial thrombus, 
if you uh, if you if you then are standing in the courtroom and saying no, I didn't do a TE in this patient with a high chance vas score, I don't think you are going to be um, uh, you're going to have much to stand on. Now, in terms of the coronaries, that's another uh, situation. Um, I think you know, just as a start, you know, the the typical locations you're often ablating in say the aortic root are are generally reasonably far from the coronary ostea. Uh, but um, uh, I think that even with that, uh, I use ICE very carefully to try to evaluate and define the relationships between where our catheters are going to be likely ablating in the coronary ostea. And so, uh, so I rely on that. And um, uh, for most of those alpha tract ablations, I'm not performing coronary angiography anymore. I feel, I feel a fair amount of confidence with that. Um, but um, uh, but that's I, I know from uh, you know uh, from talking to other colleagues that use ice extensively. There's there's some variation to that approach. Um, and maybe this is someone graduating trying to buy equipment for their labs. But uh, can you <laughs> talk about the benefits of the St. Jude versus Acunav? Yeah. So so let me tell you. Uh, I want to start with a caveat. So of course um, I don't. I'm, I really want to try to remain unbiased between, I'm not trying to sell one company or another. Um, I use both catheters. Uh, uh, the currently with the what's available right now, uh, the Cardo, uh, the big advantage of the Cardo mapping catheter, or ICE catheter, of course, is that it integrates the ICE image into the mapping uh, image. So you can create an anatomic uh, shell with your ICE image. And that can be quite useful, especially I find for like alpha tract ablation, but even for some left atrial ablation, some folks like to use it in that way. Um, but I will say that the image quality is inferior to the St. Jude image quality. The St. Jude clearly has a better image quality. Now it's, uh, and then uh, a disadvantage though of the St. Jude system as well is uh, it's very clearly a stiffer catheter. So you have to be very careful about manipulating that, especially in the vascular system before you get into the heart and even into the heart, of course. But I think uh, frankly, and, and you'll hear a lot of that from Mansour later today, uh, but he uses the St. Jude system extensively and uh, he has a ter terrific you know, safety record with that. I think it's, it's, it's all about you know, obviously experience and knowing what, your, what the tool is and how to use it. Um, so I use both, and I think you, you can you can do fine with either one, honestly. Okay, great. And then there was one more question here about um, monitoring the esophageal temperature probe for uh, floralist procedures. How do you do that? Yeah, yeah so that's one of that falls under the category of there's many ways to skin a cat. Uh, so I mentioned during the talk that so, the, some of my colleagues will uh, tr will visualize the temperature probe on ice in the esophagus. And when you can see the echo brightness of the, the um, recording electrode, the temperature, the thermistor, uh, you can identify that and move that up and down uh, on ice. I don't do that. Um, uh, what I do is I, uh, I actually um, uh, uh, fix a, um, a, uh, a quad mapping catheter to my single electrode temperature probe and uh, then, then plug that quad cap catheter into the mapping system. And uh, I know there's, you know, I don't know if Will Sauer is on the line here, but, but he has some really interesting data about the potential antenna effect of the metal electrodes, whether it's the temperature probe or the uh, quad catheter. So I, I, I actually purposely op offset the um, electrode uh, at least a centimeter away from the, the recording electrode so that um, at least theoretically you're minimizing the, the risk. And then as a result, you can see the, you can see the, the mapping catheter and, and by extrapolation, the temperature electrode location on your mapping system. So, sorry, long winded answer. No, that's great. All right, I think I got through most of the questions here. If anyone else has any other questions, you can unmute, or if anyone else has comments, feel free. Sean, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear Paul, you. Paul, thank you for doing this. That was great. Good introductory talk on ICE. Uh, we uh, agree with your, your points of relying on ICE, and uh, thank you for doing this. I have a question about 3D ice. I think that's coming. There's some availability already, and I uh, know that's not a ice 101 question, but um, it's very impressive what it can do. I guess the question is, with the added cost that will come with that, do you feel like there will be a significant role for 3D ice? And that's a great question as well. I mean, I think we are we're we're still in the um, the steep slope of where technology is going to come out with uh, and, and industry is going to come out with all these really cool tools and toys. And uh, we have to, as a field, I think, justify that it's going to actually improve our procedures. And I've seen a lot of that, that work, and it's very cool, actually. And, and I think 
the other thing that that you, that's underlying your question about that with 3D ice in particular is is if you those of you who already use ice, it's the the uh, one thing I didn't mention in my talk also is especially if you're creating an anatomic shell, it's a it's a manual process, so it can be quite tedious. The the mapper has to has to create contours, and that's that can introduce inaccuracies and it slows down your procedure. And I think one important step to get that to where it might be actually useful for our workflow is an automated contouring, which, which I think is something that's going to happen in our near future. And I think once we put that together with 3D imaging, I think uh, the possibilities are, are, are going to be quite interesting for what, how we can apply that to our, our, our EP procedures. So. Yeah, thanks. So it may not even be the 3D aspect of it as much as other features. You know, it'll be digital steering to make 3D, yeah. but that digital steering will, you know, avoid all that catheter manipulation potentially. Yeah, right, exactly. Because there's another thing I didn't mention is the practicality. So there's a, obviously in the audience there are going to be a variety of um, there are going to be a variety of uh, of um, uh, settings in the EP lab. You know, if you're in an academic setting, you'll have a fellow, and one of you can try to you know, be be assigned to the ice, one to the ablation catheter. But you know, if you if you've done that already, you know the hands get crossed over and in the way. There's you know, there's there's a lot of stuff we're trying to manipulate, and so I think things like automated catheter manipulation might improve that. And certainly, if you're in a private setting where you're you're standing there by yourself, uh, you know, it, it's it's your two you, your your two hands are, are not enough often for all the stuff you have to move around. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome.